Hello, and welcome to Android Developers Backstage. I'm Romain Guy from the Android Toolkit team. I'm Tor Norby from the Android Studio team. I'm Chad Haas from the Toolkit team. I'm Chuck Jasky from the Compose Runtime team. I'm George Mount from the Compose UI team. And I'm Leland Richardson from the Compose Engine team. We have a Compose episode. Really? It sounds like it. And more specifically, we're going to talk about Compose and performance. Oh, performance. Yay! Yeah, so a bit of context, uh, you know, Compose has been out for, for quite a while now, and Compose has always been top of mind, uh, performance has always been top of mind for us. Uh, but, you know, as we've been looking at performance in Compose and improving it, like we've done before with the UI toolkit, with the view system, we found a number of interesting things, and we figured it would be interesting to talk about what we found, what is useful for app developers, you know, what tools we use, uh, and, you know, what, what may get better in the future. So I'll start with a dumb question. As an app developer, do I have to do anything about performance or do I just have to keep upgrading to the latest and greatest and, and you know, your compiler and runtime is taking care of it? Well, there's a, it's really a combination. Uh, we're always trying to improve the runtime and the compiler, but there are certain things that you can do that will really uh, tank performance. But basically, if you, you have to pay attention to how much time you're spending in a composable function, what kind of parameters you're passing to ensure that we can actually do the skipping and the, and the restarting that we're supposed to do. Um, there's one way to do that. One way you can get a report from the compiler to tell you what, how we're generating the functions, whether we're generating the skipping logic for a function, uh, whether we consider the parameters stable. Um, stable means that we can actually do the skipping. We can actually do a comparison and it makes sense between compositions. Um, and so you have to pay attention to that. And that's why we have a, a compiler flag that will emit a report. So if I have a composable function that has a couple of parameters, is that going to be a problem? No. It, like, w when is the kind of scenario where I'm going to tank my performance? There's some, certain things you'll that are obvious. Like, for example, if you're doing a sort on the in a composition function, uh, then you're going to every time you recompose, you're going to be doing that sort. Um, so it's better to have those things done inside the model, and then the view just being rendering of the of the model. And so you try and avoid the the reason is because composition runs on the on the UI thread and it runs every frame that there's a change. So if I have any logic that is not about just creating composable widgets, I don't have I only have fors and ifs and so on on like actual model objects that are being rendered. That's probably okay. It's yeah, that's starting to do. That's the intent is that the uh, composable functions you can think of as a transform function that transforms the data that you have into user interface. And anything that you're doing that's not that is really not supposed to be in a composable function. And you should, you should move that outside the composable functions. Okay. If there are some things that you can do to really help your performance. Uh, for example, moving some things from composition into the layout or into the drawing phase. And uh, we really encourage you to to do that when possible. For example, uh, box with constraints is a composable function but that allows you to get the uh, the size of your composition, uh, size of your your layout. But um, uh, often it'll be better to use like a uh, a custom layout instead of using box with constraints because you can do all of that layout on <clears throat> during the the uh, layout phase instead of doing it during composition. So it'll, sa it'll save you having to do it through extra passes during uh, creating your UI. Is that for the, like, I, I have this thing where, you know, in the bad old days, when I used to linear layout, I wanted something at the top, I wanted something at the bottom, and I want the middle to stretch. And I was kind of struggling with how to do this in Compose, you know, because I had that stretchy part. And what I wanted to do was, like, assign all the weights to it or something. So it seems like I kind of need to know something about the constraints. And it sounds like this is what box with constraints is for. Uh, actually, uh we we do have that capability in our uh, row or column. So, uh, and that's done completely within layout. I see. So I should just read the manual. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> got it, got it. Yeah. yeah. When you don't, when you're looking for a feature, look for a modifier. Usually it's, it's somewhere in the modifiers. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. In, in that case, uh, what we allow you to do is use a parent data modifier to uh, let your child tell you what the weight is in that case. And then uh, the parent can say, oh, you have a higher weight, and therefore I will stretch you more. Um, and so let, let, let's you, okay. you know, have communication between those two. So taking a step back here, uh, I mean, Tor's initial question was, do you have to do anything? Like, is this something that I as an app developer need to worry about? 
and all, all the answers we just gave are kind of, um, their performance issues that happen mostly during recomposition or when we're talking about, uh, reacting to state changes. And most of the, I, I, I think in, in Compose's history, we've probably focused a little too much on that type of per- performance profile. And the, the things that have really been biting people lately is, uh, initial composition time. And, um, and those are things that don't, don't really factor into to a lot of what we just talked about. Uh, but, but actually it, for, for a lot of cases is the most important metric to, to kind of be worried about. Um, and the thing is, is a lot of those improvements are not really things that, uh, that app developers can affect quite as much. And a lot of it goes into inefficiencies of Compose right now. And um, we've made a lot of improvements in those over the last few releases, and there's probably a lot of improvements to come. Um, but those are things that upgrading will probably help uh, more is um, the initial composition cost. I should point out too, like for historical context, like how, how many centuries did you spend Roma like tuning the performance of the view system once it was created? Right. So like step one is build the thing. And then step two is tune performance forever. Um, and I think that's sort of a phase that, that we entered with compose once, once the fundamentals were solid, then it was time to go in and say, okay, now, uh, where, where are the, the potholes that we did, did not envision and, and what do we do about those? So it wasn't, it wasn't just me, right? We spent 15 years optimizing the view system, uh, all the way to, it's not perfect, but we, we had reached the point where the only fixes w- w- that were left to do were architectural and without changing the APIs or removing features, we, we couldn't optimize views. Um, and hopefully, you know, with Compose, it's not going to take us 15 years to, to get there. And I think there, there, there are great examples of apps that perform admirably re- well with Compose. Recently, there was Threads that launched. Uh, it's written in Compose and it's, it's a fantastic app. Um, but, you know, we, like Leon said, there are things that we ourselves learn only once people start using Compose at scale and we understand how people are using the system, right? There's always a, a bit of a discrepancy between how you design your system and how it ends up being used. Uh, and also there are some things that we just haven't thought about. I think a good example, of the, and we probably have talked about this in the previous podcast, but was all the work for modifiers, right? Like there, there's been a lot of big improvements in the implementation of modifiers. So the app doesn't have to do anything. We just made it better. Yeah, I, one of the one of the nice things about you know when you were tuning the view system for those fifteen years, your improvements <laughs> would be available to people on the latest API level only. Whereas with Compose, because it's bundled into the app, you know you can basically get all users of your app to get these improvements when you update. So that's pretty nice. Um, can you tell us more about these modifier improvements? Um, yeah, so this was uh, one of the architectural changes, as, as Roma mentions. We um, we noticed as people started using, uh, compose more and more, and we, we started using compose more and more ourselves and, uh, building up new functionality and new things. Um, the, the system that we had built for modifiers early on, uh, one of the big, uh, kind of tools that it had was this modifier.composed API, uh, which allowed you to uh, essentially take a, have a modifier that wasn't really a modifier at all. It was actually just a composable function that would execute and allow you to use composition to create state and model effects and things like that, and then return a new set of, uh, of sort of base level modifiers from it. And, um, this API kind of opened up, uh, a lot of new possibilities with modifiers, but in hindsight, it, it ended up being, um, kind of a, an API that was solving a problem in the wrong way. And, and there was, uh, it, it's, it's a neat API, but it was the fact that we needed it was exposing the fact that the modifier system wasn't complete. Um, and there were a couple of kind of really inherent issues with the modifier composed API, um, that as time went on really started to, to bubble up. Um, and so we noticed that that certain like really load bearing critical modifiers like uh, modifier that clickable was kind of the the main one that uh, kind of triggered this investigation were way more expensive than than you would think that such a modifier should be 
Um, and so we kind of sat down and thought about the, the ways in which we could change the system. And uh, we introduced this new modifier.node API, um, which is sort of a, a, a sister API to, the, to what was the existing modifier API, but allowed you to more efficiently uh, kind of manage what what the modifier was doing over time uh and uh you know create state and utilize the the life cycle the natural life cycle of of the modifiers um and so we created this new system and uh and started migrating a, a lot of the modifiers that we had in um in our APIs and the the improvements we saw were were pretty substantial so for instance clickable um, you know, I, I think is somewhere between 50 and a hundred times faster than it was, uh, originally. Um, and that, that was clickable itself ended up, you know, being a, a higher level API that utilized, you know, 15 to 30 sort of lower level APIs. Um, and we, we kind of had to migrate each one of those independently. And, um, and so we saw, you know, little bits of improvement, uh, along the way, but, um, most of these changes ended up in compose 1.4 and compose 1.5. And so the, the actual, um, uh, composition performance in those applications is, uh, is much, much better. Um, we, we had a, a, a sort of a macro benchmark that, that tested a, an app that where the initial composition time, uh, was reduced by 70%, um, to, to give an example, the, these modifiers end up being a very large portion of the actual composition cost. And, uh, and so we've re reduced that, that quite a bit. And that's something very interesting, what you just mentioned, right? Like, um, the, the, the sentence we like to use that we are the inner loop of the application. So we tend to worry more about small or, or what some might call micro optimizations, because if we micro optimize a composable, but then, you know, when you launch your app, you have hundreds of composables for initial composition. It matters a lot, right? That's how we can shave off entire like, milliseconds or dozens of milliseconds. Um, so the way we approach performance can be quite different from the way an app would approach performance. So the kind of things we do matter to us and to the app but you know when you're inside your app code you wouldn't do things the same way necessarily um, that said you know there were architectural changes like the modifiers we just discussed but then we also did a number of small optimizations that are more language level or data structures uh so it may be interesting to, to talk about that a little bit like chuck for instance like in the in, in the engine in the runtime like were there interesting things we've done like to because like there's the slot table right like everything goes into the slot table so obviously it's a high traffic area what do we do to keep it fast <laughs> well some of the things we do in the slot table is there's a current slot table design uh uses a gap can you buffer just, can you just explain what the slot table is in sure so the slot table is where remember goes um so if you remember anything the where that data goes is into the slot table and any information that it, that compose needs to recompose the composition goes into the slot table. So what functions you've called, whether you've taken a branch uh, previously or not, uh, how many iterations of a loop you did last time, uh, all that information goes in the slot table. So when we execute the function again, we know what changes it made and we can reflect those changes into the tree. And so the primary data structure that composition uses is the slot table. Uh, we currently store that information into a gap buffer, um, which is a linear uh, array that has a gap in it, which is allows you to insert and delete efficiently. Um, and that has serviced really well. Um, there are some efficiencies we get because the slot table is essentially a linearized tree. So what I mean by that is that uh, a group contains children. So if you do a call, then it forms a what's called a group in the slot table and it's maintaining information about that call and then any calls that it makes are subgroups within that group and those are laid out linearly within the slot table and the parent group knows how many of those subgroups are there but it doesn't have a pointer to them it just they're linearly like there's 10 of them so it's followed by 10 children and therefore the next 10 groups or the next 10 uh, groups that actually have other groups will be the children of that group. And so we saved some, some data there. We also changed it, uh, from some initial implementations to being, to avoid boxing. 
uh, values. So the slot table is linearly laid out in an int array. And so there's five ints per group, and we just do multiplication. So if you want the 10th group, you multiply it by five. And how do you, like one of the things I struggle with, not in Compose implementation, but in general, is how to size data structures, right? You know, like most most of the uh, the data structures will auto resize internally, but there's a cost, you know, they're like for a hash map, for example, right? You know, whenever it sort of gets too full, it'll go and copy and, and, and rehash everything. Uh, and this is one of those things where if you have run the app before, and this is what I do sometimes, I run and see how big are you? And then I make that the initial size. Is there anything that you can do uh, as an app developer to sort of give clues to the system, you know, where, okay, I know that for my data, this thing is going to have, you know, 450 elements. So, you know, go straight to 450. Don't jump there via, you know, uh, a bunch of successive. Yeah, we, we don't. Um, and the main reason is because we don't want you have to know about the internal data structures uh, at that level. Let, let's say it wasn't the app developer. Let's say it was our own profiler, right? I ran a benchmark. It recorded some file. It's kind of like a profile gutted optimization, right? Is there something yeah. like that that could be done? Not right now, no. It's a good idea, though. It's a, it is a good idea, yeah. Yeah, we we've talked about doing something like that. Um, we we've thought about some like compose specific profiles that could exist, and and th this could be one uh, you know such usage for that. Another thing that it could do is um, we we have in a given compose application, there's uh, lots of composable functions which are restartable. So this is sort of how compose does its recompose logic. Is is every every composable function that is uh, uh, returns unit. Um, those are essentially uh, possible restart points. And um, the thing is, is that most applications don't actually restart in that many locations, right? There, there are certain pockets where there might be some state that changes, um, you know, rapidly as 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 certain things happen. Uh, but they're they're kind of few and far between, despite the fact that you have many. Uh, many of these functions that could possibly be it. And so one of the things that that, um, that profile could do is, is kind of, uh, estimate or provide a good educated guess as to which restart points are actually going to be used, uh, so that we could, uh, potentially elide the other restart points. Um, that's, that's another thing that we've talked about as, as like a potential. Um, from a tooling standpoint, this is, a bit clunky. Uh, you have to think about, you know, how do we, how do we create this profile? How do we feed it into the Compose system? And where does that tooling live? And and how much do app developers need to know about it? This is one of those areas I feel like we made some progress now in in the latest Hedgehog Canary. You know, you can basically create a new baseline profile uh, module, and then there it automatically creates a run config for you. So like I just set new module, blah blah blah, hit finish, and then I get a new run config. I run, and that does all the you know, it basically launches my app, <laughs> you know, multiple times, captures the file and puts it right, right into the right source file, right? So I feel like something like that could be done here, right? Where where you use a Compose UI test to basically drive your basic scenarios and then we should do the rest, right? Cap, you know, not just capture the baseline profile, but possibly some runtime information about branches taken and sizes of data structures and things like that. That's essentially where that feature would go. Uh, if we ended up doing something, it would be in the macro benchmark uh, where we do the baseline profiles and we would capture that information. Uh, we don't have that feature now, but that's a certainly what I would emphasize is that anyone who's interested in startup performance do macro benchmarks, create a startup profile um, and get that going in their application as soon as possible, because that's where we collect the information to do these optimizations. The interesting thing about this type of thing is right now, Compose, uh, as far as build tools are consult concerned, really only resides at the Kotlin stage. So, like per co we, we're a Kotlin C plugin, and we operate on each compilation unit uh, individually. Such a profile guided optimization would need to reside later on in the build uh, lifecycle, and so we'd probably need to build a whole new tool in order to to implement something like that properly. Obviously, when you use R8 um, with shrinking, you get other, you know, I mean, your pure Kotlin code is going to be optimized, if nothing else, right? I'm just wondering, since you're a compiler plugin, you have a lot of power already, or are there things you could do if you could do sort of whole program optimization at the bytecode level later? Yes. Uh, so if, if, you, if you operate later on, uh, where you have the whole program uh, 
Um, and you don't need to, the, the big thing is that you don't need to worry. You have all the call sites and you don't need to worry about binary compatibility. Um, and those are sort of the, the, the two things that, that, that give you the magic to do a lot more. And there, there's quite a few optimizations that we have thought about at this stage that we could do. Um, but we're, we're kind of trying to exhaust a lot of, uh, a lot of the options that we have available to us right now without introducing a new type of build tool. Um, we've also explored uh, ways in which our, we could kind of influence um, uh, build tools at, at the later stage like R8 or ProGuard to, um, to sort of do the things that we want it to do by, by creating some, um, by generating some ProGuard rules and things like that. And it's fantastic that we have something like R8, right? And we benefit a lot from it. It does a lot of optimizations in general for Kotlin, but but also for Compose because we use Kotlin so much. But we also want to be careful, uh, you know, following what Leon just said, because A, you may not be using R8, right? So some people don't use R8. They might, they might use another solution. So we can't guarantee that you're going to get those optimizations, but we also need to be. Uh, to worry about the, the the debug experience, right? When your app is not in release mode, because running R8 takes time. It's, it's an expensive step. So we also want the debug experience to be as fast as possible. Um, so, you know, a lot of optimizations that, that we want to do would matter for, for, for this case as well, when you're not running R8. There's a lot of stuff that we can do just looking at like runtime performance profiling, as well as um, uh, I've been using like memory allocation stuff to see what's going on. There's a lot of low hanging fruit just because there was a lot of code written um, that may have some overhead that we can simply eliminate. Right. And that's that's down to the fundamentals of like what what are the data structures that you're using? Yeah. So that's interesting because uh, b- back to your previous question, Tor, about, you know, sizing data structures, th- th- there are a couple of fixes we made that, you know, th- small optimization right but you look at the code you reason about the data structure and you realize oh we always put two items in this map do i need the map or you know i end up copying this structure into another maybe i could size the target structure so that we don't resize it multiple times or you just run the code on you know a representative data set and you size your array or whatever it is uh, so that we, we we minimize the number of resizes so there are a number of optimizations like this that you know we can do that we have been doing uh, and then there are a lot of uh, other interesting optimizations, I think, that are around Kotlin itself. Uh, I think, George, you, <laughs> you were doing some of that recently. Yeah, I was uh, recently looking at our use of, um, uh, what are they called? Uh, L- lambdas? The lambdas, yes. Lambdas with, <clears throat> with primitives. And um, lambdas with primitives are pretty interesting because uh, when you look at them, they look, you know, they're really convenient to use. You uh you know, you take an int, you return an int, you may do a transform on it. It's great, looks good. You know, passes code review, everybody looks at it and says, that's fine. But uh, what you might not realize under the hood is that the lambda is actually converted into a function of int int. And because it's taking a type of int uh, int, it's actually turned into java.lang.integer. And uh, wait, why does it do that? It's just the way Kotlin works. It, it converts a lambda that has primitives into the uh, uh, you know a function of type t yeah, you know and when when george says function there is a type actually called function yeah sorry in, in java so, so what you're saying is they don't have a runtime class that has the primitives in it they're yeah. just using the generic function with an any okay I got that's it. right yeah so it's it's using a generic function and so it's every like something r8 should fix but okay <laughs> <laughs> yeah r8 loses a lot of the data though that's unfortunate right because it doesn't necessarily know that the type is of type that the t type isn't is a primitive right so it, by the time you get to r8 you've lost a lot of information well the, there's actually some of that information there ju- just by accident. Um, this kind of information. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So th- this is, uh, George, George and I haven't talked about this yet, but I, I, I've, I've had a few conversations with the, with the R8 team around this particular issue. And, um, I, I think, I think this is something that, uh, that R8 can, can probably solve, um, at, at a more fundamental level. That'll be fantastic. Yeah. Because right now we're, every time we call one of these functions, of course it, it boxes it. And then on the other side, it, unboxes it and then if you return this uh, primitive you have gone again box it again and then you unbox it again and if your type is a float now there's no way of have using the same object again. there's no caching so you're, so, you're doing a lot of and, and the problem for us that some of those lambdas you know sometimes they're like in the implementation because it's Kotlin, everything takes a lambda 
it's in our inner loop and then you know you run the the memory profiler and you realize that somewhere deep in like drawing or pointer event processing we end up calling one of those lambdas in the loop and we're allocating hundreds of objects unknowingly right, right. and most of the time for an app that wouldn't matter but again if it's in the pointer event management of the app and we're causing garbage to be created and we're causing a, a garbage collection step, you know, especially on older versions of Android, well, we created a problem, right, that we can address. Uh, so we're not saying like, hey, fix all your lambdas. We're saying we're looking at this kind of stuff because it matters to us. Right. And and it's even it's even worse when you talk about value classes because you look at a value class, it doesn't look like a primitive. Uh, and like color is is really just a long, right? Uh, in... in, in um, and compose, but uh, you look at a, a, a value class. You, you you accept a value class and you return a value class. It it doesn't look like it's doing anything wrong. Even if so you're conditioned to basically accept these things, like oh yeah, objects are fine because that's probably an int. Yeah, and in some cases it isn't. That, so what you're saying is you need a lint check. Well, or or, or, or it might be worse than that because with the value classes, what might happen is that it looks like an object. It looks like all you're doing is taking the object, returning it. But sometimes, depending on what you're doing can be very subtle, but there's going to be an unboxing, a uh, boxing, an unboxing, a reboxing. Well, if it's nullable, that'll happen. Uh, nullable will do that, but it can also happen in other situations, especially once you call the, the standard library functions uh, that, you know, have to be very generic, so they do things that, you know, will. And so, yeah, look at the bytecode. <laughs> this is one of the reasons that uh, the way Kotlin actually transforms lambdas is... Um, is actively bad here uh, because because it even if you don't call any standard lib uh, libraries or anything it, you can just return the int and it will actually like so if you if you have a lambda that just takes an int and returns it um, that that will actually create bytecode that is an unbox in a box uh, because the way Kotlin actually uh, generates the bytecode here is it it creates a lambda that that is you know function one of int comma int. But then it actually generates a signature as a part of that class that is a, a, a private invoke function that has the primitive types. And, um, and so it, it'll unbox it to pass it in to, to the primitive sig signature, and then that will return it, and then it'll box the result and, and then return that in the virtual method. But coincidentally, that is exactly the information that they accidentally provided, which which I think makes this optimization possible for for R8. So yeah, that, that, that's a good example. And then there are, you know, there are other things in the language, uh, like the one I was looking at not so long ago uh, was the problem of iterators, right? When you when you iterate over a, a collection, and it's interesting because in Kotlin, like the for loop, right? When you want to iterate over uh, just a range of integers, you have this nice syntax, like for i in, you know, zero dot dot 10. Uh, but then there's, there's amusing gotchas where if you do a step, uh, use the step keyword to step every two integers, then suddenly you're not taking an optimized path. And now you're taking a new path where it's actually creating iterators. Uh, and it's much more expensive, which again, mostly won't matter, but if you end up doing that in the drawing code and we're doing it per pixel, that's that's really bad, uh, at least as far as we're concerned. Um, so yeah, and you mentioned Lincheck. Uh, so there's good news here. We've we've been writing Lincheck's for those things. But I, like, I would think that, for example, would be something that R8 could revert again, right? Some, so R8 does some of that, uh, but again, the problem is we can't, and that's great, but we can't rely on R8 always being there. And again, in debug mode specifically, if this kind of stuff is going to slow down your experience, it might be worth for us to fix it because you're not running with R8 and we don't want your debug experience to be, you know, horrible, right? Um, and, and I think in, in Kotlin, you know, there's a number of of language features, like another one that, that comes to mind is, you know, mutable list of and mutable, mutable map of, uh, those are nice function, uh, but mutable list of creates an array list, it doesn't let you size it. Um, so if you want to, to precise an array list, you have to use the concrete type directly, uh, which is actually pretty good because then you have the actual concrete type, which can help the compiler and the optimizer uh, instead of going through an interface. Um, so do you generally create array list directly in the compose code? No, most of the time we use mutable list of, but there are places, for instance, where, you know, we made the change to like use the array list directly so we can size it uh, and, and save like reallocations. Uh, mutable map of is also interesting because by default, so Kotlin, we use a linked hash map that has a different behavior and a different performance profile, for instance, than other data structures. Um, and then one thing that, you know, we run into, and that's not specific to Kotlin, but 
it's the nature of standard libraries, right? Where the APIs might get in your way of of performance sometimes. So I'll take an example of, of, of a fix I made where when we parse a vector drawable, so we have an XML file and we're going to parse a lot of floats, like tons and tons of floats. Both in Java and Kotlin, you have this, feed, this, this API float.parse or string.parse float, whatever it's called. But it takes a string. It doesn't take a string with a start and an end. It takes a string. So what you have to do in your code is you have to parse the source string, find yourself where the float start and end, which is basically parsing a float uh, already. Then you have to make a copy of that substring, and then you can call parse float to get the actual float. So you're parsing the, the, the string twice. You're allocating a new string. So the fix in this... If you call substring, it doesn't actually copy. It doesn't copy, but you're creating a new object, right? That points to the same array, but you're still creating more objects. And again, when you're talking about a vector drawable where there can be thousands or millions of floats, that, that adds up. Um, and so the fix here was interesting. It was to, to have a custom uh, parse float function that takes a string, takes a start and an end, and will parse the float. And when it finds the end of the float, it gives you not only the float, but also tells you where it stopped in the string. So then you can pass it. Basically, it's the next float, like find me the next float. Did you pass? So you're passing back a pair. So you're, <laughs> you're creating an object to return two things. <laughs> no, you pass a, an object where to store the results. <laughs> yeah, right. uh, but yeah, that's interesting, right? Because sometimes the, 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 the libraries, the APIs you have at your disposal are missing the tools uh, that you need to be efficient. And I think that's something we're, we're also thinking about a lot in Compose, like what are we missing? What are we not providing that, that prevents you from writing efficient code or ourselves sometimes? Yeah, oftentimes we don't want our app developers to really focus that much yeah. on writing super efficient code, right? Because we're, we're, like you said, we're the inner loop and we really care about performance so that you don't have to, the app developer doesn't have to. I mean, really the dream is that if you come to us saying, I have a performance problem in my app, I would love to be able to confidently say, yeah, it's not a, it's not our fault, we know that. It, it has to be you. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, we'll, we'll, we'll never get there, right? But yeah, to your point, like ideally as an app developer, you shouldn't have to worry, or at least not more than at a high level, you know. Um, as long as you don't sort in your composable, that's what I learned today. <laughs> Well, it depends how many items you sort. <laughs> if you're sorting like three items, you know, it's... So so one of the things I remember from, you know, the, the views world was, you know, you don't want really deeply nested hierarchies because there was some very big cost to measuring face and something like that. Is there anything like that with Compose where it just doesn't scale or is that not a thing? Anymore? Well, more specifically, the problem you run into with views was some of the layouts could measure multiple times. So you could end up in an exponential measuring pass we we did fix some of that over time by introducing caches and as we all know caches only ever fix problems they never create problems <laughs> <laughs> uh so it got better but yeah the, there's good news on that front in, in compose yeah we, we did look a lot at the existing stuff in views and we we saw the performance problems that views had with uh, with respect to the you know multi-pass yeah multi-pass um layout. So we, when we did that, we looked at trying to pull it into as a, a single pass layout for Compose so that you could do things like animate the layout. I know Chet here might be familiar with animating layouts. Um, <laughs> uh, so <clears throat> we, I mean, the, the goal is to be able to do those kinds of things in a reasonable way, be able to animate layouts, to be able to have deeply nested layouts, because that's how people think about the problem, right? You, you don't think about, well, I guess if, now with constraint layout, there, there's actually a great way of handling large layouts in, in uh in one layout but uh you know we people typically think about you know rows of columns and things like that uh, and so they can actually write their code the way they consider it and so you know each layout then uh can just do a single pass and say okay measure your child measure your child measure your child okay now i know how big i am now i know how big i am and, and just report it all up up again yeah, and, and in general, like just like the view system, uh, we try to not invalidate or rely out things that hadn't changed. I mean, Compose makes that more general. That's what Chuck was talking about earlier, where, you know, we know what data has changed and we skip, you know, Chuck mentioned skippability, right? We skip as much as we can. Uh, so th there's, but, you know, to Leon's point earlier, uh, there's always the first composition, right? So if you have, I don't know, 10,000 composables, uh, to bring up that screen the first time, we do have to run that code at least once. So, you know, it depends. 
Could we do the like the interleaved uh, the thing that we used to have with like you know gifts coming down on a on a on a slow connection where like we're just going to give you some of the views in your hierarchy, some of the composables, and then on the next pass we'll do some more, and eventually your whole hierarchy will be there. Well, that's what web pages do, right? So sometimes you see the web page like slowly build itself, <laughs> and then you get to the part you're about to click, and the ad comes in and moves everything down. Right. Yeah, I mean there there are the lazy APIs, which isn't exactly what you're you're. Uh you're thinking of, but, but can kind of accomplish some of the same goal if you write the code correctly. Um, but yeah, I, I was just going to say in, in response to Tor's question is, you know, I think, uh, with compose, we've, we've really made the toolkit fairly modular, uh, so that there's no, um, you know, there's no sort of single load bearing class that does all the things that, that, um, that you're, you're paying for the cost of all those things, every instantiation of it. Uh, and that, that has brought the cost of abstraction down much lower. And, and as the name compose implies, we, we kind of embrace, uh, you know, com- composing behaviors together and, and, uh, you know, really kind of being, uh, abstraction forward, I guess, you know, in, the, in this case. And, and so I think what we found is that, um, people really like writing code this way and, and, you know, instead of avoiding every, you know, linear layout and, and all this nesting and stuff like that, we have people that are, are writing incredibly layered code, um, because you can and, and it's, and it's convenient and, and nice. The problem is that we, we didn't make that cost of abstraction zero. We made it a lot less, but there is still a cost. And so now when you see, you know, something that would have been a single layer before in compose, might be 50 and uh and and so while that you know that still is valid functioning code um that cost of abstraction a non-zero cost of abstraction does start to add up and one of the things that i'm focusing a lot on is is how can we reduce that cost of abstraction to to the absolute minimum so that people can continue to write code this way and it uh and it really isn't a problem yeah, the goal is really to to pay what you what what you, uh, for what you use, right? Uh, uh, one of the examples when we were designing Compose that kept coming back, I think, as the the poster child of what we didn't want to do was button and text view. Uh, when you look at the source code of button.java in the view system, it extends text view, and that's it. Like it has basically no code in it. And you look at text view, text view can do like marquees and it can be editable. So I even did, I think for a conference, I even uh, jokingly showed how you can make a button selectable, uh, which makes no sense, but the feature is there, right? So there is code that we run when you initialize the button just to be like, oh, you're not selectable. And then the view, the, the base view class itself can do everything, right? It has focus and scrolling and whatever. Um, so. Yeah, to Leon's point, like in the view system, you know, even when you could just create a button, you pay the cost for a number of things that you will never, ever, ever use in that button. And that's not the case in Compose, right? The idea was like a button should be exactly what you need. When you do text, it does only text and nothing more. And if you add scrolling, then you pay for scrolling. Uh, and that's why I like it so much cheaper. So we talked a lot about sort of CPU cost. What about, what about memory cost? Um, I, I think with Compose, at least, you know, we have modern Android development now. So you're, you're kind of encouraged not to just, you know, pass around these objects that point to everything. But it's a little, it's a little harder than it used to be, too. You used to just pass around the activity <laughs> and you stash whatever state you wanted there. And now you're encouraged to sort of pass just what each composable needs, which I think is good practice. Uh, and so I guess you have fewer uh, memory leaks but I'm also wondering with all this extra data passing, if that comes at a cost. Well, it's not really extra data because one of the things that's interesting about Compose is that for the most part, right, not always, but you, the, 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 the state of the widgets is what you give the widgets. Um, so there's only one state and that solves a number of like bugs and stuff like that. Whereas in the view world, you have your state, then you replicate it inside the views and now you, you, that state exists twice. Right. So we use more memory and it goes back to also what Lynn was just saying, where if you look at text view and view, because they have all those features, they have all those fields for features that maybe you will never ever use, but that we have to instantiate in memory every single time. And so I, I, I would love to know what is the, the ratio of like, you know, allocated memory versus useful memory in the view system, but it's definitely a lot lower than it is in Compose. One, one thing we do see though for memory consumption is uh, the duplication of a framework, right? Because Compose is a UI framework. 
And we're essentially, you know, like you're talking about focus uh, is, is something that the view does, but we also have to do it because we're a sub view, right? Uh, uh, you know, we have to do our own drawing infrastructure. We have to do our own uh, layout infrastructure. So all this stuff we, we're, we're doing also. And so you know, when you get Compose, you get this, you know, huge library of, of Compose into your app. So we're kind of like, you know, have a minimum size that we we're, gi we're giving your app just by including Compose. So we are working on that. And, you know, the, the profile, uh, optimization really does help with that. So I hope you're using R8, uh, in your apps, but, uh, uh, we, we are going to make your app bigger if you're using Compose. Yeah, but you but you you're also getting what we talked about earlier, which is that you know you're getting all the <laughs> all the improvements in Compose will always go out with your app, as opposed to well, no, <laughs> you're on this older version of yeah. of Android, so you don't have this these fixes and these improvements. Yeah, that was that was the trade off that we decided from the beginning. Like we had kind of hit the wall with the UI toolkit, where every fix we implemented was in a future release, and developers kind of hated that, uh, especially for features. Like, yeah, that that looks nice. I'll I'll care in five years when my users have it. And um, a few years ago, we said, okay, we're going to offer a toolkit that is going to be in Android X, and you bundle it with your app because that is the fix for that problem. But the trade off is, yep, hey, you're going to have the whole toolkit in your app. Yeah, we struggled with this in the in the layout editor, right? Where I think relative layout had some behavior changes at some API level, and then we're having a situation. Well, what do we render? How do we render this for you to show you what it's going to look like? Because it depends on the API level what this will look like, and this is kind of gone. Well, here's your answer: you just render. It depends. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's complicated. On the topic of memory allocations, they compose. Uh, you know, I think one thing that um, it's probably good not to dance around is that the actual pattern of of composed code the the declarative paradigm um does lend itself to be a little allocation heavy um it, it's it's pretty easy for you know you have a composable function which like chuck mentioned is, is a transform function so you, you take some data in and then you pass data uh data out to to the whatever functions you're calling and when you do that the the transform itself may take some number of objects and then allocate a new object out of those objects. And um, we recompose. So we, we call that function again when something changes. And so if you write that code uh, just kind of point blank, it's going to allocate that object every time uh, you recompose. And that, that might be wasteful depending on how often your function recomposes. So if you are doing an animation, for instance, and you you uh, you're recomposing every frame some function. You might be allocating some object that has nothing to do with that animation, but you're allocating it every every call. And so th those are some of the challenges that we um, we face. And in some cases, you know, maybe it doesn't matter so much. In other cases, uh, we we try to do the smartest things we can in the compiler. Um, but like a, a very common example of this that, that's probably concrete is is just modifiers. Uh, so whenever you're creating a modifier chain and passing it into a composable function, um, you're allocating essentially a linked list of, of these lightweight classes. Um, but anytime your function recomposes, you're, you're probably allocating that list again. And a lot of times that that's pretty wasteful because the actual modifier chain isn't changing at all. You know, you're you're just saying you know, size 20 dot DP. And the next time you get called, you're, you're saying the very same, you know, size 20 dot DP. Um, and those modifier objects could be hoisted into some higher scope and, and you could avoid that reallocation every time, but writing code like that isn't quite as natural and, and things like that. And so th this is kind of a, a common problem that we have to contend with. But that seems like something that you could do in your compiler plugin. Yeah, we, we've talked about, um, for instance, hoisting modifier and stuff like that, but it, it's very difficult to prove that the, uh, that the allocation isn't producing some effect that you're relying on. But if they're all your own modifiers, you should be able to reason about them being immutable, right? What do you mean by your own? Y you, you, the Android X team, <laughs> right? You know, you see a chain of modifiers. These are all our classes. We know these are all immutable. We can basically catch yeah, the problem the compiler has uh, in that regard is that the compiler is knows about the runtime, but it doesn't know anything above that. It doesn't know about UI. Um, and it really can't because it's 
the compiler and the runtime are generic to what they actually do. So Compose, when we talk about Compose, we're talking about it targets the, the UI uh, by default. That's what you do when you're doing Android. We do uh, Compose for desktop. Um, but that's not what the Compose runtime thinks of. The Compo- ru- Compose runtime thinks about that it's creating a tree, but it doesn't know what that tree does. Or what it what it is, and the modifiers are actually introduced by the run t- by the UI, not by Compose runtime. Right. I just mean that, like you know, R eight has a bunch of special cases for optimization. Going, ooh, we know what this is. This is a this is a special objects dot equal method. You know, that may require a pair level whatever twenty four, but we're going to sort of translate this other thing. It just seems to me that it, modifiers are so common and modifier chains are so common. That having a special case in the compiler plugin for this, even though conceptually that's just a library. We won't be able to know about a particular modifier. What we could do is we could come up with an annotation that you could modif- you could annotate the modifier with that the compiler knows about. And this is where annotations like stable uh, annotate that we use within the runtime, uh, that's where they get involved. Where the com- You give the compiler some information that it can use during compile time that's more generic than, oh, by the way, this is the you know, the fully qualified class name of uh, something that I know about. The annotation allows us to do these optimizations. So we'd have to come up with an annotation that would describe the behavior there that you're, that you're saying. We actually already have this annotation. And so we, we already, we already utilize this in, in some ways. A, a very important function of this podcast is basically Chet Roman and I throwing feature requests. <laughs> mostly, mostly Tor. Mostly Tor. <laughs> yes, guilty, guilty is charged. <laughs> I, I've I've personally been been thinking about hoisting modifiers for a long time as a compiler optimization, and and um, we we have the stable annotation which um, which we leverage in in this way a little bit, but we we don't do the the hoisting just yet. Um, and one of, one of the reasons is that if you apply it point blank to all modifiers, then um, we actually lose a little bit in in static initialization costs uh, for for the library, which is something that we're trying to. Um, trying to be pretty careful about right now. Uh, and then there, there's also, so we, we could, if the, if the entire modifier change. Maybe you could, you could just do it for really long lists. That's where, like, where the payoff is big. The interesting thing about modifiers is that we, we, if we have probably one more annotation, then we, we, could, uh, we could leverage the, the fact that partial modifier lists are, uh, could be extracted. And so um, if you've got you know, some dynamic modifier bunch of static ones and then a dynamic modifier, we could actually pull out the middle part of the list. Um, but that requires some knowledge about modifiers. And so we, we are kind of keeping our cards close to our chest. We don't want the, the compiler to know too much about the, the libraries above it. Um, and, and so that's one of the reasons why, why we haven't done that. Um, but, but these are things that we're, we're definitely looking into. It's, they, they have unintended consequences um, sometimes. And, and the, the initial load right now is a very hot path. That, that we're worried about. There was a saying years ago about just make it a setting, uh, which is how you end up with settings that are infinitely long. Um, so maybe make it an annotation would be the the new version of that. Um, I I wanted to uh, I wanted to talk about. So Leland brought up the hey, this is a new thing, and we are going to be doing allocations. And this was like a a thing that occurred to me when I ran the the memory profiler on just a no op app. All it did was spawn basically an invalidation saying hey, I want want to I want to draw a frame or I want to draw several frames and if you do this on the old system like assuming you're not allocating anything you're not doing anything like running a ripple basically nothing is allocated so the 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 state of the world on the old classic view hierarchy was we didn't allocate anything on your behalf if you weren't asking us to do anything and you do that on compose and we do Right. And, and then the trick is, okay, what are the things that we absolutely need to be doing? And this is the trade off with this very rich system that we have versus what are the things that we really shouldn't be? Why are we, why are we allocating a hash map? Why are we auto boxing these things along the way toward doing a recomposition? So some of the, some of the core stuff that you see that I don't think we can get away from is we're going to be, you know, allocating things having to do with snapshots and recomposition. If you're doing nothing else, just drawing a frame means we're doing something there. They're relatively cheap, but along the way, yeah, we're doing some other stuff that we need to fix, right? Like we shouldn't be, you know, auto boxing to put it into some generic collection because there are better ways to go about it when you are that core of the inner loop. Yeah, what's interesting about that location is very often we, you know, 
we may worry about it and a big part of it is like we may cause a GC eventually but for me it's also like any constructor you run is extra code uh, that you may not have to run uh, and again when you're the inner loop and you do that a lot it's like we're just wasting cycles that could go instead to like drawing more frames or using less battery or you know um, so allocations are an interesting target um, and yeah I think the, the ones that we like to go after are the unintended ones so to, uh, uh, sorry um uh, George, that's your name. Uh, you were mentioning like the boxing, basically, you know, especially with Kotlin, like that can happen a lot. And those are completely unnecessary very often. And we can work around that. And they, but sometimes we allocate objects and we need them because we need the code to do, do something interesting. And that's okay. Uh, yeah. And sometimes uh, writing natural APIs kind of encourages uh, creating objects. And uh, <clears throat> I mean, it's, it's an unfortunate aspect to, you know, having good yeah. APIs. I mean, APIs are hard, right? So you really want your APIs to look good, to feel good, to work well. But that's interesting because I think with Kotlin, we do have the language does give us features. So here's an example, right? We had a piece of code in, uh, I think, the measurement where internally we're calling a function that returns a, a pair of ints. So the code looks good, feels good, it's nice. Problem is now we're allocating that pair every measurement and we don't really need that pair. What's nice is that with a value class, a bit of masking and shifting, we can create a pair that packs the two ints inside along. But because you have extension functions and destructuring and all that stuff, the call site still feels and looks great, right? Like the implementation is slightly more difficult to read, but that's our problem. And at least the call site is, looks fine. Um, there was also another change where like, you know, you can, you can, uh, you can, uh, for matrices and vectors, you can overload op operators directly on an array. Uh, and that way you don't create a new matrix class that itself contains the array. So you can still make the code look and behave nicely. And yet it's more optimized. And actually there's less code in the end than, than you started with. So that's what I like about Kotlin compared to other languages that it gives us those tools to like make the, the low level optimized code feel like it's not that feel like it's yeah. abstracted someone said hey that's just syntactic sugar i'm like well syntactic sugar is delicious i agree <laughs> yeah i mean th those are cases where you know colin helped us to do something by by making a pretty api and um and kind of get the performance win at the same time uh you know there, there are other cases where colin kind of actively works against us and we're, we're trying to you know figure out some of those things like one of the things that just comes to mind is, is just, uh, well, and this is really a, a Java thing as much as it is a column thing, but, um, you know, all, all of the, the collection interfaces, um, and, and the various methods you call on that, if you want to write idiomatic Kotlin and create idiomatic APIs, you probably want to accept those data structures. Uh, but by accepting those data structures and, and returning them, you're kind of opting into, um, more cost, uh, for, for certain operations. And so we, we've created a bunch of kind of workarounds for this and, and, uh, the compose code base. Um, but sometimes if, if there's a public API that, you know, you need to make sure you're, you're playing, playing the idiomatic Kotlin game, uh, it's kind of unav unavoidable. No, but it's interesting because, you know, one of the things that uh, I guess took me a long time to realize that you can have nice APIs that do offer a way out for people who care about performance. You know, I mentioned the array several times, but that's a great example where in Kotlin, let's say you have a, a function that computes stuff, right? The default, with default parameters, you can have that function return a new array that contains all the data it computed. That's great. But by specifying the parameters, the caller could be, could give you the array pre-allocated. And if you give a start and an end, you can also let them use that array for a number of things and they can pack however they want. And for people who don't care, that's it. They don't have to worry about it, right? Like they don't specify any, any parameter. They won't have the most optimized behavior, but it's going to be nice and easy. And for the people who care, well, they'll be able to care. And I think that's the key. Like I, I really want all those APIs to, to let people care, be able to care. It, it's really sucks when you're blocked because the API you're calling like prevents you from doing the right thing for your use case. And you wanted float.parse to basically let you pass in the string. <laughs> with a start and with it's more, it's a next for, yeah, exactly. But, but even collections, right? Um, I think with collections, like again, if you accept a collection, in some cases, it's good if you also accept like uh, an offset where to start putting stuff in the, in the collection because you don't know what I want to do with that collection. Maybe I want to like use it to store multiple things. 
Um, and when you force me to give you a new collection, then you, you're imposing something on me, right? Um, and, and again, I think Kotlin gives you the tools to like address both needs, uh, which is nice. There's some problems with generally with like just the JVM or the, the VM. Yeah. Uh, if you want to return a value, for example, if it, it, you know, returning a single value is pretty easy, but if you want to return two values, suddenly it becomes. Quite, like, yeah. But again, that's, that's where you may have like, uh, you know, that goes against immutability, but that's where you can have a function with a default parameter. Uh, so by default, you return a new holder for those values. But if the caller cares, they can give you a pre-allocated holder and you fill the structure. Right. Uh, of course, that structure has to be mutable, which, you know, some people will be against, but it's a trade-off that you have to worry about. Uh, I would say if a pair is mutable, uh, is it really an issue? <laughs> I don't think so. But. Right. Yeah. You, you end up having to create a new type sometimes. Because, uh, yeah. For example, a pair is not mutable. Right. Uh, but yeah. yeah. Uh, but yeah, and it's true, like some of those ab abstractions sometimes are necessary. I think, Leon, you, you know, you are talking about the collections and, and inside your code, it's different at the, at the public APIs level, right? But in your own implementation, when everything you do, uh, it goes back to the example I was giving about mutable list stuff. You know, mutable list stuff is nice because it returns a mutable list interface. You don't have to worry about what it is. But the fact is, the default implementation is an array list. So you'll end up writing code that depends on the fact that it behaves like an array list, whether, you know, for the way it grows, for the memory it uses, for how you can iterate on it, you know, whatever, right? So it's foolish to think that one day JetBrains will be able to, re to change what mutable list of returns, uh, cause that would probably break apps in some, you know, subtle ways. So now what you have is you have this method that always returns an interface and that comes with a, a cost at the bytecode level, right? And you propagate that. And there's a number of optimizations, both in Rite and the, co the compiler that go away because the compiler is like, ah, I don't know what that is. That's just a mutable list. And if you just change your mutable list of with an array list, suddenly your for loops are not using uh, iterators anymore because now the compiler knows what you're doing. Uh, and when it's in implementation details, do you need to be abstract all the time? I don't think so. Uh, it's okay to make decisions and to be to say like, no, this is how my code works and I'm okay with it, right? Uh, abstraction for the sake of abstractions can be dangerous. Sorry, that was my little rant. So I think that's probably a good <laughs> note to end on. Everybody's uh, like, okay, and I it's I finally think, done. <laughs> Shut up. I think, with, I, I think the the TLDR here is that all these improvements your team is making, all all you, you app developers have to do is basically take upgrades. And you get all these benefits, which is which is a pretty nice situation to be in. Uh, yeah, and several times when talking to developers, you know, they, they they have a performance issue, and we said like, "Oh, you're on one three, like please try one five RC or whatever, and and tell us if it's still there." Yeah, and it's like, "Oh, and get the latest AGP, and get the latest Kotlin." And, get <laughs> and let's return to the previous point. Let's let, let's make it really clear: all of the like low level gnarly things, like "Oh, avoid auto boxing." That is what we need to do. We do not want you to ever worry about this stuff. We find it interesting, which is why we're talking about it. Um, but it is really something that should be done at the library level so that the app developers don't need to think about stuff like that. That is true. But when you work on an app, especially at larger companies, you know, there, there will be a sub team that does the design system, right? For the company. And so they are building a, a suite of widgets. And so they might want to be inspired by some of those optimizations we make because they'll be in a similar situation, right? Uh, hopefully not as low level. Uh, but you know, how you optimize your recompositions, you know, are you using too many remembers, uh, that kind of stuff. I think it's always good to be aware of performance and the tools, uh, call out to memory profiler, which I've been using a lot lately. Um, but also, uh, bytecode decompilation is really good for seeing like, Oh, Hey, Kotlin sped that up for me or Kotlin did not. Although, yeah, the, the, the one, the one caveat about the, the Kotlin bytecode viewer in, in the ID, which is fantastic is that it is before uh, Dex and R8. So sometimes you see things that are worrisome. And then if you look at the actual bytecode that I've post Dex and R8, you realize that it's not a problem. But, but yeah, we, th that's usually a good indicator uh, of what's going on. Uh, it's also a good way to understand, you know, how things work, uh, which I think find very helpful when it comes to performance. It's also very indirect performance wise, but I've been using live edit recently with Compose. It's pretty nice. It's sort of, you know, um, it makes that iteration really, really fast. Just related to live edit, I, I just wanted to give you know a PSA maybe to our listeners. We, we talked a little bit today about debug performance and um, debug performance in Compose uh, has been an issue for a lot of people. And, and a big contributor to that has been uh, a result of live edit's predecessor, 
which was live literals, um, which made debug builds much slower in certain situations. And, uh, and so newer versions of studio will turn live literals off and give you live edit. And that will, uh, that will make debug performance in compose, um, uh, much more reasonable. Yeah, because real quick, li live literals basically had to wrap all the literals inside an object, right? More or less? Yeah. Um, basically, yeah. It was a little worse than that. It was not okay. just an object. It was actually a mutable state of. Oh, I see. Okay, yeah, yeah. It wasn't mutable state unless you were actively using live literals. Uh, but the problem is that it it turned all bytecode into like every literal was a method call and, and a switch and a field read and, and an object and, and stuff like that. And so a lot of like really hot code paths that use a lot of literals and, and uh, you know, primitives and stuff like that would, would uh, de-opt in, in really bad ways. Um, and so even if it wasn't a state read, it was, it was still actively bad. But just to be clear, you still have to turn live edit on because it's not on by default. So, you know, if you want this performance improvement, go turn it on. The other thing I'd like to point out is is just to make sure that when you're doing performance analysis that you're you've got your app in a state that your customers will see. So um the macro benchmark framework does a really good job of this for startup performance. And so if you're if you're trying to gauge what the performance of your application is, then the macro benchmarks is what I would what I would drive you to to maintain that performance over time. The other thing I would focus on is if you're just looking at it doing ad hoc performance, make sure that you're you're doing a release build that you're you've got R8 turned on if you're going to be using it. Um, that you have an install of the profile version of your of your application on the local machine. Because okay. if you're not doing that, then you're getting a different performance profile than your customers will see. Uh, yeah, and you may be wasting a lot of time optimizing something that yeah. you don't have to optimize. <laughs> right. There might be some things that just don't show up at re retail because they're fast enough. Um, and that we, like R8 was able to optimize that or some part of doing the compilation process where you're not jitting anymore. Therefore, your your performance is not, is not janking anymore. All right, then. Well, thanks, everyone, then. Thanks. Thanks.